Hello, this is Mr. Johansson here with the second part of the astronomy lectures. This is uh, the second part of the outside the moon and earth astronomy, where we've started to get farther afield. The first lecture we talked about solar system astronomy. Now we're going to move very far afield into stars. Take a look at this picture we're, we're seeing right here. This is the Tarantula Nebula. It's one of the many places where we see stars being born. If you take a look at inside these bubbles, you see some hot blue stars. Those blue stars were formed by the cloud. They turned on and they're blowing, their, their gas coming out is blowing a hole in the cloud that gave them birth. And turns out you could see bubbles all over the place. In this cloud, it almost looks like a sponge. So many stars are turning on and they evacuate these vast caves inside their clouds. This is the amazing picture that came down from the Hubble tel telescope in 1994. This is called the Pillars of Creation. And it is one of the millions of birthplaces of stars. And this is just a stunning image. If you take a look at this star right here, it's one of the bright stars, a very hot star that formed out of many stars that formed um, from this area of space. But this cloud is all that's left of the original birth cloud of whole bunches of these stars. And if you look at like the top of the cloud, you could see places where there's looks like little candles and at the tip of each one is a star. And the star is clearing out the places behind it. Um, so that is a stunning picture. Of course, it shows us the creation event itself. That's why people were amazed by this shot. You could see how solar systems like our own were born. This is the Orion Nebula in the constellation Orion. If you look at the belt hanging down from the belt is the sword and if you look at the middle star in the sword with a pair of binoculars you'll see that it's a fuzzy region and this is a close-up view of it in a telescope and also you see hot blue stars blowing out bubbles there these are beautiful nebulas places where stars are born to take a further step back when we see a galaxy this is an image of a galaxy with the blue stars really highlighted. Anytime you see blue stars, well, blue stars are hot, bright stars that have a very short lifetime, very short lifetime. So if you see blue stars in a galaxy, you know stars are currently being formed right there. The galaxy wouldn't have had much time to change since those stars um, have turned on. And we know that those stars have just turned on because they turn off so very quickly. Okay, so when we start trying to make sense out of the stars, you and I would go outside and what can we say about stars? Well, we could say some stars are brighter than others. This is apparent magnitude. You can tell it's not that big a deal because it's a totally Earth-based perspective, but it's all we had to go on for a long time. So it's just a measure of how bright a star appears to be to an observer on Earth. Hipparchus in about 150 BC, uh, he devised a system of classifying stars by how bright they actually looked. The lower the star's magnitude number, the brighter the star is. Each magnitude is 2.5 times brighter than the previous one. So he said one is the brightest star he could see. Okay, um, with better observations, we see there are even some brighter stars. So we actually had to go into the negative numbers to talk about the brighter stars. Six would be the faintest star that he could see with his naked eye. And on a beautiful, um, clear sky at night, um, if your vision was spectacularly wonderful, you might be able to see down to sixth magnitude stars. But if we look at this, when we put other things in this scale, we see the sun would come in at magnitude negative 26.7, really bright. Uh, the brightest star that can be seen um, is Cirrus, which is negative uh, 1.4. 
On the far other end, the faintest things we can see with our telescopes are somewhere around magnitude 30. So once we have this idea of apparent brightness, how far they look, we really had, or, or how bright they look, we really have to start getting the idea of how far away are they? Because that's going to affect everything. First thing to realize, space is huge. It's so big. The things we use to measure distance on Earth would be meaningless. The closest thing to us is 239,000 miles away. That's the moon. What are you going to measure that? Are you going to compare it to trips to Florida? Right away, we're in a category where miles are, we just can't relate so well to miles. As soon as we talk about the sun, it's 93 million miles away. How are you going to connect with any distance you've ever been to 93 million miles? And when we get out to the planets, we're talking 26, million, uh, 26 trillion miles to Alpha Centauri. And that's the very closest star to our sun. So the numbers are mind boggling. To make space distances less confusing, we need a new unit. So we use something called the light year. And that simply is the distance light travels in a year. It takes light eight minutes and 20 seconds to get from the sun. Remember, 93 million miles away. Only eight minutes and 20 seconds, boom, light gets to us. The moon is only 1.2 light seconds away. Now, in that way of thinking about it, the nearest star is 4.4 light years away. It takes four, almost four and a half years to get a ray of light from the nearest star to us. So that's a nice, easy counting number. You can relate things to that. So we're going to use light years to talk about distance in space. There you go. One light year is about six trillion miles, if you have to relate it to miles. But I can't relate to six trillion miles, can you? Now, now that we have some idea of distances in space, astronomers can do some kind of neat tricks. Um, what we have to do is we have to get all the stars to seem as if they're the same distance from us. Because as soon as we do that, now, if a star is brighter, it's because for some reason it's actually brighter, not that it's closer. Recognize that's really important. Apparent magnitude is just how bright they appear. You might have a fairly dim star real close to us that appears very bright and it's meaningless. So we have to talk about how bright they absolute how bright they absolutely are, and that's absolute magnitude. So we determine this by determining the actual distance to the star, and then astronomers mathematically calculate what the star would look like from that distance. Astronomers use a tremendous amount of mathematics in their work. So they use a distance of 10 parsecs, which is 32.6 light years. A parsec um, is a handy way for astronomers to talk distance because every six months we're at the opposite side of our orbit around the sun. So the fairly nearby stars appear to change position against the far background stars. So a parsec is a measure of that change of distance. And it turns out one parsec um, is 3.26 light years. So when we convert it to light years, 10 parsecs is 32.6 light years. So absolute magnitude is the apparent magnitude of a star if it was a distance of 10 parsecs, or about 32, 33 light years away. We realize that there are some nearby stars closer than 32 light years that we would have to push further away. And of course, mathematically, we push them further away. But almost all the stars in the sky, we have to pull a whole lot closer to get everything to be 32.6 light years away. So let's talk luminosity and brightness. All right, luminosity is the amount of energy emitted by an object in a second. 
The wattage of a light bulb is a good example of measuring luminosity. The luminosity of a star depends on its temperature. Hotter stars are more luminous and size. Larger stars are more luminous. If we compare them, if you look at on the top of this, two stars that are the same size, the hotter one will be more luminous. The bottom of it, two stars that are the same temperature, the bigger one will appear more luminous. So brightness is how bright a star appears to us, and it depends on the temperature and the size of the star. Those are the two big factors governing brightness. Now we start looking for patterns in, in the sky. We have everything we need to start identifying the patterns that we will see in the sky. So once mathematically you've placed all the stars the same distance away, you will start to notice these patterns. You would expect that all hot stars are very bright and all cool stars are very dim. Sure, you'd largely be correct for normal stars, but there's stars that do not follow this pattern. Why? That's where we start finding out interesting things when they're not following the pattern. So what are the stars that don't follow the normal pattern? Well, red giants, cool stars that are very large, are brighter than cool stars would normally be. White dwarfs, hot stars that are very small, are dimmer than hot stars would normally be. So if we make a chart plotting the absolute magnitude against the temperature of the stars, you get a really interesting result that astronomers use to study the different groups of stars. This is the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, named after the scientists who came up with it. And as soon as you do this, you can notice very distinct populations of stars that start telling us how a star lives. It tells us so much information. There's the amazing Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. So if we look here in the upper left and bring this down to the lower right, this is the main sequence of stars. And you can see in the upper left, big bright blue stars. They're very hot and they're very bright, exactly what you'd expect. If you go down that, you get eventually to the lower right, you get to the um, dim red star, stars that are um, very low temperature, and they're also not very bright. <coughs> so it's exactly what you'd expect. But then you see whole other categories of stars. You see these giant stars, you see these super giant stars up here. They have to mean something different. And then we have this whole category of white dwarf stars down here. Very hot, but not very bright. So that starts to tell us how stars live. So here we get to how a star works. We've learned a lot. A star gets all its energy by the process called nuclear fusion. That's where lighter elements like hydrogen form heavier elements like helium. The star starts as a huge cloud of gas, mostly hydrogen, because that's what the universe is made of. <coughs> There's nothing special about this cloud. It doesn't have to be a particular thing to form a, a star. If it's big enough, it will form a star. Why? Because it's going to be mostly made of hydrogen. And even if it's not, it would form a different kind of star. But that never happens. There's so much hydrogen. Hydrogen will be the first element that starts to burn. So if it's a big enough cloud of gas and dust and it finally collapses under gravity, it's going to form a star. It begins to contract under the force of gravity. Now we have something called the strong force. We have to understand strong force if we're going to understand how stars work. The process of making a star's energy uses a force much, and we're talking incredibly more than gravity, uh, to draw the protons together. This force is called the strong force. They're not kidding. It's a, it's a remarkable force. 
When protons fall together under this amazingly strong force, they lose a bit of mass and give off huge energy. That mass becomes the energy. E equals mc squared. Energy equals mass times the speed of light squared. The speed of light's a large number, and if you square it, it's a huge number. So a tiny bit of mass in this equation becomes a vast amount of energy. So why can the protons get so close together? right? Well, the protons get close together because the center of a star, it is so hot because of the adiabatic contraction of the gas cloud. You squished it together. You know, when you squish a gas, it gets hotter. So those really hot protons are vibrating so fast, the electrons are ripped off of them, right? The electrons to just come away from them. So the protons now it's so dense in the middle of that cloud they can get very close together and they're vibrating so fast because they're so hot so they can even get closer together so this sometimes gets them very close now of course protons are both positively charged so you'd think they would repel each other and they do they repel each other very strongly but if they get close enough and that'll only happen in the center of stars if they get close enough, the strong force takes over and slams them together. Try to get it into your head by this. If you imagine dropping a marble. Now, you know what a marble is going to do when it hits the floor. It's not much mass there. But let's say gravity became trillions of times stronger so that on the way down, this marble suddenly took on the mass of an aircraft carrier. <laughs> what would happen when that aircraft carrier hit the ground? It's the size of a marble, but it hits with the force of an aircraft carrier. In the resulting complete calamity that would occur, you get the idea of how potent the strong force is and how that could give off so much energy when these protons collide that it can make stars shine. The diagonal line going from the upper left to the lower right is a group of normal stars. They're in the prime of their lives. They're all burning hydrogen into helium. Think about um, human populations. When we're first born, we're a medical case for the first year. Um, and over not that long a time, we grow into something approaching adults. And then we can take care of ourselves and we can have our adult lives for a very long time. And it's only in the very last stages of our lives, usually, that we're also kind of medical cases again. But all in between, we're living nice, normal lives. This is like stars. They live most of their lives as gentle, calm. They just keep doing what they're doing. So the difference in temperature and luminosity on the main sequence is all about the mass of the star. The really most massive stars um, are very, very hot. The least massive stars are very, very cool. So main sequence runs from hot blue stars in the upper left to cool red stars in the lower right. The hot blue stars, they're burning um, bright and hot because they have so much mass. They also live incredibly short periods of time. In spite of having so much mass, they just go through their fuel so fast. The dim red stars, on the other hand, they're dim and red because they have so little mass, but they don't burn through their fuel quickly, and they can live incredibly long times. Cooler lives longer. So once we move off the main sequence, we get into the red giant phase. Near the end of a star's life, it moves off the main sequence. When the star runs out of hydrogen in its core, well, the core stops burning. So it can't keep back the crushing force of gravity and the core collapses. As it collapses, it gets hotter and hotter and hotter, adiabatically, of course, just by contracting. This releases so much heat to the surrounding envelope of the star that it causes the surrounding envelope to grow many times larger than it had been. And the outer part cools and becomes a red giant. We have a red giant star born. Once the core gets hot enough to burn, when the collapsing core, remember it's getting hotter and hotter and hotter, once it 
gets hot enough to finally start burning helium, which it burns then into carbon. Then the star settles down for a while. It starts seeming almost like it's having a normal life again, but it can't last. Eventually, it runs out of helium, and the contraction expansion process repeats. How many elements it can make in its core depends on its mass. Very big stars can make all the way up to iron. Our star, after it gets hot enough to start burning the helium to carbon, it's done. Another contraction, there's just not enough mass there to start burning carbon to anything else. So our sun will end up with its core being made of carbon. But if it's a really big star and it can make all the way up to iron then for the first time things happen really fast i have heard that from the time it starts making iron until the time it stops is about five hours five hours and it turns out that's the last five hours of this star's life So the last stages um, are, are white dwarfs. Uh, that's for small mass stars like our sun. Um, they end up eventually, they fluff off their outer atmosphere and they are a very compact, tiny, super hot core of a star. That's the core of the star sitting there. So it's really hot. Once you get rid of the cooler outer atmosphere, that core is really, really hot. And we would call that core a white dwarf. Uh, that core of the star that had been a million miles across, it's about as big as planet Earth. So it's not doing any nu more nuclear fusion, and it will just slowly over long, long, billions of years, it will slowly cool. And for a while around it, as it blows the outer atmosphere off, it will create a beautiful planetary nebula. It, the nebula will slowly puff away, but... Each planetary nebula is simply beautiful. So here's an example of these planetary nebula, and you can tell they are gorgeous. Each one is different. No two planetary nebula ever look quite the same. And they're all going through stages, so uh, 100,000 years from now, each one of these will look quite different, and some of the stages might morph into some of the other ones. But they're sculpted by the magnetic field and the outflow from the um, star. Um, they are beautiful. Okay, let's get back to that core that was turning into iron. <laughs> uh, the end is very, very violent. Once it has a core of iron, when that iron... Um, now tries to collapse again and do what it has always done, get hot enough to start fusing and then create energy that pushes the star out. Iron is different because when you fuse iron, you don't get energy. It requires energy to fuse iron into heavier elements. So nothing st stops the core collapse. The core just collapses incredibly fast under the force of gravity. This is way beyond what a brain of, of a human can really understand. It's our mathematics that has to run as it collapses, it eventually reaches a point where it explodes back and becomes a supernova, and the star destroys itself. Supernova releases as much energy as 10 billion stars. It's the biggest explosion possible. It blows the star apart. It may leave either a black hole or a neutron star, which are among the most bizarre objects possible. This is a supernova that Chinese astronomers saw explode about a thousand years ago. And um, this was fairly close to us. And this is what it looks like a thousand years on. That's a supernova um, remnant. That's the Crab Nebula. Beautiful. So let's talk about these stellar corpses, these neutron stars and black holes. A neutron star. Well, we first have to understand about an atom. An atom is almost all empty space. If you think of a proton um, as a BB sitting on the 50-yard line of a big stadium, the electrons are pieces of dust whirling around outside the parking lot. Um, and all the rest is just empty space. A neutron star crushes all this stuff together, so it gets it to be the actual density of a nucleus. 
a neutron star. All the matter of the star, a star much bigger than our own, all of the matter is crushed into a ball 7 to 10 miles in diameter. Almost all the matter in the whole star down to the size of a city. The funny part is the more massive they are, the smaller they are because gravity is pulling them even tighter. A teaspoon of this would weigh as much as 900 great pyramids, not the little pyramids, the great pyramids, 900 of them, a teaspoon of a neutron star. Our sun spins about once a month, so if it was to contract to a ball, see, seven miles across, that would be spinning much, much faster, sort of an ice skater. When he draws in his arms, he starts spinning faster. The sun is drawing in their arms really far, so it ends up spinning very fast. Look at that. That's a neutron star, highly magnetized, um, and it shoots these jets out from the north and south of it sometimes. An incredible object, neutron star. And now, the most bizarre thing ever. The black hole, with even more matter causing more gravitational pull. The matter collapses forever. There's nothing that ever stops it. The matter collapses forever, infinitely. Around the endlessly collapsing star, there's a region of space where the gravity is so strong that light cannot escape. It is this sphere that they call the black hole, but that's not the thing. The thing is a tiny speck collapsing forever inside it. And it's the effect of what it does um, where light can't escape that makes this spherical thing we're calling the black hole. Black holes warp space and time. Einstein, whose theory predicted it, thought while it might be possible, it's too bizarre and nature would never allow it. And there is an artist's conception of a black hole. We got a picture of a black hole um, in the past year, but uh, this is a better conception of it, warping space and time so thoroughly. When you look into it, you're seeing the stars around you because it's warping the light right back at you. Um, truly mind-boggling object. That's what astronomy fills us with. A lot of mind-boggling. I hope you enjoyed this one.